Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Tommy Wood. Now, Dr. Wood has an MD from Oxford and a PhD from University of Oslo in Norway. And now he's a research assistant professor at University of Washington. So he's gone from the UK to Norway to Washington. He's lived in many different places in between. He's the past president of um, Physicians for Ancestral Health. You can find him online at drragnar.com or on Instagram at Tommy Wood. And one of the things I really appreciate uh, about Tommy is he has a knowledge base that's so vast and can speak as an expert on so many different things, but he's also great about giving things, talking about topics from a, a certain perspective and saying, let's not, let's not focus in on what this one soundbite is, but let's take it from a broader perspective and see things, maybe how they interact with each other and take it as a whole. And that that's what I really appreciate. So in this topic, we really focus on, on the brain, on brain health, on neurodegenerative um, decline, cognitive decline, and how his research on neonates and brain injury translates into helping us understand what we can do to protect our brains. We talk about genetics, we talk about nutrition, of course, um, we talk about specific aspects of nutrition and specific supplements. We talk about sleep and, and, and challenging your brain and the importance for all these, both from a scientific and a practical aspect. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Dr. Tommy Wood. Dr. Tommy Wood, thanks so much for joining me today on the Diet Doctor podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate the invitation. Yeah. Now, as I said in the intro, you've you've got so many diverse areas that you speak on and seem to be an expert on that I want to sort of narrow narrow you down. Like what what gets you up in the morning? What motivates you? What are you hoping to discover or accomplish for this world uh, that you live in? Um, Easy question, right? Easy first question. It's a great question to start with. And <laughs> I, I'm not sure how much that narrows my focus because it's essentially as all the various aspects of things that I am interested in have coalesced together as part of my sort of academic and, and other work, what I'm really passionate about is making sure that you have a healthy brain and body for your entire life. So um, I do most of my basic research in neonatal and pediatric brain injury. Um, and that what influences your risk factor for those and how you develop afterwards, you know, it can start even before conception. It's affected by what happens while your mother is pregnant with you. It is hugely shaped by the environment that you're born into. Uh, and then that also affects how uh, you respond to later injuries, you know, your risk for cognitive decline later in life. So, so how can we change that trajectory or ensure that you have a healthy brain, and I also say body because the two are intimately connected um, for, for your entire life. So that's my like singular focus, even though it includes a lot of things. I think that's a good answer. Now, <laughs> what I think a lot of people might find confusing, though, is here's a guy who's focusing on newborns, and his research is focusing on newborns. Yep. And, and yet, he's talking about changes that can translate to you know, as we age in, in the elderly. So, and you've also focused on athletes with traumatic brain injury, like whether it's football players or MMA or whatever. So neonates, athletes, but then what most of us are pro who listening to this podcast are probably most interested in is how do I prevent neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's disease, maybe Parkinson's disease or recovering from a stroke, but certainly like Alzheimer's. So how do you see the translation from neonates to preventing Alzheimer's and, and how did you connect the dots? So when you look at what happens to babies who are born prematurely, so I, I use bab babies born prematurely as like the, the case study to kind of describe why all these things are important and, and how you can actually infer from uh, that scenario how you might prevent uh, cognitive decline or maybe even reverse cognitive decline uh, later in life. Because when babies are born prematurely, and so as most people know, the you know, we think about uh, pregnancy should be nine months, call it forty weeks generally in, in in sort of medicine, right? And nowadays babies can survive up to you know if they're if they're up to about twenty two weeks of gestation, so just over halfway is what we currently call the the limit of viability. Um, and the earlier, the more premature you are, 
uh, obviously, the, the, the greater the risk is that you won't survive. Uh, or if you do survive, the more likely you are to have some kind of uh, neurodevelopmental impairment, uh, cerebral palsy, uh, some kind of uh, disability as a result of being born so prematurely. When you're born prematurely, um, you have a, a multitude of insults that actually translate again to the number of things that we are exposed to uh, as you know, adults or people developing in the world. So they are nutritional insults. Obviously, you're, you're cut off from the placenta and the umbilical cord that provides you with amazing uh, nutrients and, and sort of looks after you. Um, there's an oxidative stress insult because you're suddenly in an environment that has a lot more oxygen than you would normally develop in. Uh, there are uh, social and other stresses because you're no longer in this nice sort of safe womb environment. You're now, you know, often sort of isolated in an incubator as they fill you with tubes and, and all these things to try and keep you alive. So a lot of these things are also very similar to um, some of the stuff that we get later on. Oxidative stress, inflammation is a big one. They're at very high risk of infection. Often um, infections may precipitate a, a preterm birth. So a number of things we talk about in terms of our long-term health of our brain and body, you know, they're happening to these tiny babies. Um, and we know that if you look at adults who are born prematurely, their brains are biologically older than somebody else who was who went to, to full term. So they have a more rapidly um, aging brain. They also die sooner of uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, they're more likely to have insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So all these things start earlier and you're on a faster trajectory. Um, and so from that, we can also see, well, well what improves or you know, mitigates some of these risk factors? So we know a lot about uh, muscle mass in babies born preterm, that, that if they have more, that can be protective. Uh, we know that if they are born into a stimulating and challenging environment, then they have better cognitive uh, function, they have better, they have better executive function. Um, and so all of these things are also what we see in adults, that in terms of how we, st how we stimulate ourselves, the environment that we exist in, these are directly connected to our brain and our body and health and, and, and how they relate to our long-term cognitive function. So that's, that's how you can kind of see ac basically across the entire lifespan, the same things matter. And so then, mm. you know, depending on who you are and, and where you are, you can potentially intervene with very similar things and sort of alter your long-term trajectory. That's really interesting. I, 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 I have a hard time seeing that connection and the way you describe it though sort of makes, makes sense. I'm like, okay, I guess you can see connecting the dots there. But, but I think one of the issues is that the, um, when you talk about somebody, you know, who had normal childhood, normal birth, um, and now they're in their forties and fifties and experiencing all the metabolic you know, derangements that come with living in our society and saying, you know, what are my risks of cognitive decline? How can I prevent that? Um, it, it just seems like a whole set of different insults. You know, when you talk about brain injury, it's like the, the micro injuries, the chronic repetitive micro injuries of metabolic disease would be very different than sort of like the extreme, um, right away when you're born. So notwithstanding the, the, the differences or, or the similarities, like do you, do you still, I mean, I guess in your mind, like whatever you can do to help that neonate is similar to what you could do to help that 40, 50 year old. Is that sort of like part of what your, your research and thought process is? Yes. So obviously there's some, um, you know, differences in terms of like the stage of development that you're trying to implement something, um, that, that might, that might change the exact tool or process that you use, but, sort of the overarching things that are important are still important. So we know, so you talked about, um, uh, you know, the metabolic insults, right? So there are a number of things that we can do to improve metabolic health. That's important whether you were born prematurely or not for your long-term brain health. Uh, we mentioned muscle mass, incredibly important for maintaining uh, cognitive function uh, throughout, throughout the lifespan. Um, we t the, one of the really, one of the things that I think um, is probably not focused on as much, but is, is maybe the most important thing is how challenge the brain. Um, and to, to sort of like provide some, some better context for that, if you think about the brain like a muscle, you know, you have to challenge it in order to build it up. And then you also have to keep challenging it to a certain level to keep it. Uh, because the brain is like any other metabolically expensive part of the body, which is that if you don't use it, 
you will literally start to use it because that is taking up resources that you don't want to spend if you don't need to. And the challenges that we um, give to our brain as we develop are much greater than the challenges that we give to our brain as we get older generally. So the process of learning how to manipulate and move this sack of flesh in 3D space is incredibly difficult. Like the cognitive uh, uh, demand for that is huge. Just like learning language or learning social interaction, these incredibly difficult uh, cognitive processes. And this is what we're doing for the first, you know, 10 to 20 years of developing our brains. Um, but yeah. then as you get older, you stop doing that. You go to work, you do the same thing every day. Uh, you learn to drive, driving becomes an automatic process. All the things you do are no longer challenging. Uh, but we know that if you continue to challenge the brain and you know, provide new stimuli, even late into life, you can both reverse and prevent cognitive decline. You can see increases in gray matter on your MRI if you, create, if you add a new challenge, even, even late in life. Um, and particularly things to do with balance and, and motor and coordination. So we're often told that, uh, you know, the, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Like your brain is this fixed thing that you have as an adult. And then like, as, as you start to lose it or whatever, it's, it's too late. But that's, that's not true. There's a huge amount of evidence that says that your brain is still very plastic and adaptable and can grow and, and, and change and improve even late into life. So that's why if, if you think about just like, what's the stimulus you're giving yourself, it's going to be much less than you were, than you were giving your brain as you were you know, developing as a kid. But you, there's still a lot right. more that you can add. There's challenges that you can add. And these have, you know, there's, like I said, multiple different areas that you can do it. And a lot of evidence to suggest that that's going to have a, a really significant lasting effect on brain health. Yeah. I like that description of the timeline. Like as you're aging, everything's new, everything's a challenge. And then you hit the plateau where suddenly you could get very comfortable where yeah. nothing's new and nothing's a challenge. And, you know, plenty of companies are trying to cash in on this as being a potential helper and with, you know, apps for puzzles and stimulating things. And so I guess one question is, and there might not be an answer, is like, what is the level of stimulus needed? You know, is just doing the Sudoku puzzle a couple of days a week enough? Or is it really need to be something continual every day, multiple hours a day? Like, is there a threshold effect there that as best as you can tell by looking at the literature? So I don't think Sudoku uh, is enough. I think it's better than nothing. Uh, but it's, it's it's like that traditional thing. And actually, when I give uh, talks on this on this topic, I have like this timeline of of, of how we uh, exactly as I described it, how we challenge our brain less and less throughout our life, and then we get to retirement, and it's like this tiny tiny amount, and then we add like Sudoku, which sort of increases a little bit. But compared to sort of the original challenges, it's still very little. Um, I think you need to do something that's challenging enough that it creates frustration. Because there's mm. um, the neurochemical response to being frustrated, you know, includes release of cortisol and catecholamines and all these, you know, things that we get when we're frustrated um, that seem to be important for this sort of like adaptive response. But it obviously it can't be, you, you can't get so frustrated that you quit. So right. it needs to be difficult enough that it's challenging. And then maybe after like 20 or 30 minutes, you're like, okay, I've, you know, I've had enough. For, for today. Um, but but then you, you maybe you find a sweet spot. But there are a lot of things which are sort of self-regulating uh, in that manner. So um, one of the most important things I, I think is, so if you look at, say, exercise and how exercise is associated with preventing cognitive decline, the biggest signal seems to be for um, exercise that involves some kind of balance component. Um, so uh, dance, uh, you could do, you know, skateboarding. Uh, you could be slacklining. You know, anything that challenges, again, how you're uh, basically, you know, rotated or placed in 3D physical space. That seems to be, if you challenge that, that seems to be a much stronger signal for this uh, sort of plasticity, this sort of like response that we want. Um, and you know, for the for all of those things, right? You go skateboarding. You're only as good. As, as, you, as you are in that in that moment, it's very difficult to sort of push yourself too hard. Obviously, you could fall over and bang a knee or something. But, <laughs> but there's like, you have, you know, those processes, you have to slowly get better over time. You can't just suddenly go out and be, be amazing at it. So that that kind those things are often self-regulating. 
Um, but then you could also be learning a language. Uh, it could be novel social interaction. Um, it could be learning a new skill uh, like uh, computer code, right? That, that all, all of these things um, are these sort of novel challenges. Um, but then the important thing to remember is that once you get good at it, it's no longer a challenge. So you have to do right. something else. Um, and so it's this sort of like continual lifelong uh, learning process that's important. Which is interesting because it, it, I'd assume there's a barrier of entry there. Like, like, you know, people, so many people have spent their whole life in a career doing something and with frustrations of work and, and then retirement comes is like, ah, I can finally put those frustrations away. I don't need to challenge myself. I can finally relax. And that sounds like it's exactly the opposite of what you should be doing, but that seems like the, the most common path. Like I finally made it. Now I can turn off the frustration and turn off the challenges. And that's, I would assume, why we see so many people with cognitive decline soon after retirement. Does that seem like the, the mechanism that works best in your mind? Uh, absolutely. And we, there are a number of uh, studies that s suggest, obviously, it's diff you can't randomize people to do this. So it's difficult to you know, truly understand the, the, the causality. But uh, people who retire earlier, once you adjust for things like medical conditions that, that might cause you to retire earlier and, and would be confounders, if you retire earlier, you die earlier um, on, on average. And so the, the implication would be that when you stop using your brain or your body um, or both, depending on, on your job, then that signal for survival um, is no longer there. And, and we know that, say, if we're talking about the brain, we know that neurons have a self-destruct signal. If you're no longer you know, asking that part of the brain to do something, those neurons will wither and die away, you know, just like you will lose muscle mass if you stop exercising. So yeah. you know that those processes exist. Um, and, it, and it seems to be as, as much as we can tell uh, from, from the data that if you, you know, retire and you just then go at home and sit on the couch, you know, that's going to feed forward and you're going to get a more, more rapid decline. Hmm. Interesting. Now, now you've mentioned exercise and, and muscle mass a couple of times. So when you talk about exercise that involves balance and involves sort of like concentration and proprioception, and those sort of make sense to me, although with, with a word of caution. So quick personal story, my son had got really into uh, hockey. You know, here we are in San Diego in Southern California, and he wants to play ice hockey. It's not exactly everywhere. So he's doing a lot of uh, uh, roller hockey, street hockey. And I thought, oh, you know what? I used to play street hockey back in college. I, I got some rollerblades. I put them on within like 30 seconds. I was on my butt and I was in a lot of pain. So <laughs> I, a definite word of caution of older people trying those types of activities that, uh, there's definitely a, you need to learn it again and be safe, but you've also mentioned muscle mass. So, so that seems like a little bit of a disconnect though. How can muscle mass affect your brain? I'm curious how you, how you connect those dots. Yeah. Um, and a great question. Very important. And, and again, across all the different um, you know, parts of the life where we may look at this, it seems to be uh, important. So if we go back to my, um, my premature babies, and I'll, we'll, we'll get to the older people, I promise. Um, but like I mentioned, if you look at how uh, babies are developing, if they're born prematurely, um, if, they have a, if they gain greater muscle mass or a greater proportion of their body composition comes from muscle mass as they develop, which you know has nutritional and environmental components and all those things, then they have better cognitive function, you know, in, in childhood. And we know that the more muscle mass you have uh, prior to a traumatic brain injury or a you know severe illness, you know, the better your your recovery. Uh, we also know from the sort of the few studies that have looked at it that your muscle mass is directly correlated to your brain mass, essentially. So once you adjust for the size of your body and the size of your skull, which is obviously very different from person to person, the more muscle mass you have, uh, the more gray matter in particular you have on an MRI scan. And things that, you know, in, in a similar manner, things that don't matter as much are your absolute BMI, your body fat percentage. Those things that were looked at in the same study don't correlate with your brain mass, but your muscle mass does. There's, there was also a study at the UK Biobank that saw a positive correlation between the amount of muscle mass you have and uh, a measure. They, they did a, a an intelligence. They called it an intelligence test. Fluid intelligence was the the test that they did. Basically, the more muscle mass you had on average, the greater your performance uh, in this in this fluid intelligence test. Um, then the question might be, well, 
Like, why? Um, <laughs> and right, is it just a marker of overall health, or is there something specific about the muscle? So it certainly, so it certainly could be just a marker of overall health. You know, it's going to be uh, correlated with physical activity, um, but in general, it's also protective in the setting of you know, as, as we gain more total body mass. So in general, at the population level, the the larger your BMI, also the larger your muscle mass, and that the muscle mass is the major confounder. You know, we talk about. Um, how you know obesity is potentially protective against some things. Generally, most of that signal is driven by the muscle mass rather than by anything else. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons why this could be the case. So we know that muscle is by far your best sink for glucose. So diet doctor listeners are going to be very interested in insulin sensitivity and metabolic health. And the basically the more muscle you more muscle you have, and the more the more you use it, both are important. Uh, the greater a glucose sink that you have. So the better your glucose control, then you're not exposing your brain to large shifts in glucose. Um, move, you know, having that muscle and moving it, you know, also is anti-inflammatory because it, you know, creates this short stressor that is pro-inflammatory and then results in, in reduced uh, in inflammation. Um, so those are like the, the glucose centric one is probably one of the most important ones, particularly if you think about cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease, as some kind of you know type three diabetes, as some people may call it, you have insulin resistance in the brain. Um, muscle mass is going to be protective against that because that glucose is just going in, into your muscles rather than you know sort of like circulating around your body. So that so as a glucose sink, that's probably one of the most important uh, reasons I think that muscle mass is protective for the brain. Yeah, so you, I, I like the transition there though into into a glucose sink and that glucose. And potentially insulin, insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia as being quote unquote causative or directly correlated, or you know, pick your word for your degree of association with cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. But it's clear there's some sort of a relationship. I think maybe the the degree of the relationship is still being discovered, but um uh, what do you, what's your gut say about is it causative is it you know correlated is you know the the whole metabolic disease blood sugar swings hyperinsulinemia is that what we should be targeting first and foremost to prevent cognitive decline more than anything else at a population level i think yes but only because metabolic disease is so common um and the way that i think about insulin resistance and metabolic disease in general is this um, ba basically sort of intersecting uh, effects of oxidative stress, inflammation, and, mit and mitochondrial function. Or, and with there, you have sort of like total caloric load, like how much you know, total energy is the body being asked to process. The level of those different things is going gonna, is gonna to matter differently for different people. Right, so we, so we know that um, you know some people are really great at accumulating fat mass, and to a certain point, that's very protective. Whereas other people who can't do that, you know, then you sort of you become inflamed and have this oxidative burden due due to that, you know, at, at a much lower body mass. But the balance um, is, you know, the the end result is the same. Uh, but it's just because, so if, if you have some kind of inflammatory disorder, so say you have rheumatoid arthritis, you become insulin resistant uh, without necessarily having to you know, gain a load of fat mass first, because you have this systemic inflammatory insult that then drives that that insulin resistance. So the the different combinating factors are going to be different from person to person, but that's kind of the downstream effect. Um, when you think about the brain, I sort of see you know that everything is these potential uh, insults so we have toxic exposures of which glucose is one uh, but you also includes air pollution maybe heavy metals uh, in your water you know water quality in, in the US not great in a, in a number of places um, you know so there's the, these multiple exposures which cause neuronal stress could be infections right there are some studies suggest certain infections can can be you know causing cognitive decline in certain people, um, certainly other environmental toxins. And then you have protective factors. So muscle mass is obviously one, um, you know, things that you do to modify your exposures. Uh, and then you need some kind of demand on the brain. The brain doesn't just hang around unless you're asking it to do things. That's what we talked about earlier. So 
those are the three things you have like these insults you have protective factors and then you have the demand and the connection that you have in the brain and then you know different amounts of those things are going to be uh, differentially important for different people but glucose i you know i think glucose itself is a stressor for the brain as well as for you know multiple tissues in the body so controlling that is going to be one important factor right so when you talk about controlling glucose controlling inflammation um, improving metabolic function. I mean, does everybody need to be on a ketogenic diet to prevent cognitive decline? Is that the way to go for everybody? So n no, <laughs> no, I don't think so. As long as you uh, take care of all those other things, there are there are certainly um, plenty of populations and individuals that have uh, cognitive function late into life despite eating a number of uh, you know a high proportion of carbohydrates in, in their diet. So no, I don't think that's necessary. Um, however. Uh, another interesting thing about babies uh, is that is is how they use ketones for for their brain, and and that's uh, you know everybody talks about ketones as an alter alternative uh, metabolic fuel, um, but in reality, if you're thinking about ketones in relation to the brain, they are, you know, obviously they they are and can be used as just a, a, a source of of energy, uh, but more so they are used as synthetic precursors, um, and so. Uh, babies generally are in ketosis for at least the first week of life to a certain degree, and they they generate ketones while they're being breastfed, or you know, in uh, if your baby's in the hospital, they are usually given some kind of lipid formulation that includes a lot of MCTs, um, which they would normally get from breast milk because which were important in, in producing ketones. And when you look at sort of the biochemistry, and this has been done mainly in rats, but in this particular uh, uh, sort of area rats are very similar to, to humans um because there, there have been some uh, studies done in like aborted human fetuses that, that show the same the same results uh that the the brain will preferentially take up ketones and if you give it both ketones and glucose which is normal for a baby right if you've got breast milk or something the the glucose will be used for energy and the ketones will be used to make uh saturated fats and cholesterol which form the the main structure of the brain um, so I think this is important both for building a brain or repairing a brain after you have a brain injury. So there, you know, a lot of interest in ketones and traumatic brain, brain injury, and, you know, we'll have uh, covered that previously, but not just for a metabolic fuel also, because you're going to need to repair those structures that, that, that got injured. Uh, and I think it's the same, you know, as you, if you do have cognitive decline, uh, first of all, you have the issue that maybe glucose isn't getting in as a substrate because you have some a poor uptake of glucose into the brain. We see that in people with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but equally, so then ketones are beneficial. But but then similarly, if you want to try and repair some of that brain as much as you can, then ketones are going to be an important uh, precursor. So they they have a really interesting role in building and maintaining a brain structure. So I think it's going to be more important in the setting of injury and disease. Uh, but if you never get that injury or disease, then I, I, I don't think that you necessarily need to be on a ketogenic diet to, to keep your brain healthy. Yeah, I really like that differentiation. I mean, it does seem that the prevention and the treatment are, are very different. And like you said, there are, there are plenty of examples of populations who do very well from a, a neurodegenerative and a cognitive standpoint without eating ketogenic diets. So prevention can take many forms. A keto diet certainly could be one of them, any diet that prevents those insults, like you said. But then treatment, on the other hand, once the damage is done or, and once the disease process is there to the point where it's causing cognitive decline, then ketones take on their own their own um, world, their own benefit. So it's it's more than just the metabolic health benefits of a ketogenic diet at that point, it's actual ketones themselves. And and um, you and Brianna Stubbs authored a paper in 2019, Exogenous Ketone Bodies as Promising Neuroprotective Agents for Developmental Brain Injuries. So for developmental brain injuries, and I assume for you know later cognitive injuries as well, and there have been a number of studies that have looked at ketone supplements and, and ketogenic diets. So what, what's your sense of the state of the science um, as it exists now for using exogenous ketones, MCT oil, you know, ketone diets, a ketogenic diet specifically to elevate ketone levels as treatment of mild cognitive decline? So I, I think as active treatments um, it, it, on the brain injury spect spectrum, we probably have the best evidence for cognitive decline. If you think about some of the work that Stephen Kinane and others have done, I think there's, there's enough to say that it is, it is worthwhile 
um, implementing ketogenic diet if that's possible for you in the setting of, of cognitive uh, decline. Um, and it's obviously, uh, so if we think about uh, Dale Bredesen's work, uh, people may be familiar, who he, he institutes a multifactorial uh, process of trying to uh, reverse cognitive decline, which includes um, a sort of a ketogenic type diet because of um, periods of time restricted eating as, as well as the, the macronutrient uh, balance. And, and that what is published so far is you know, very impressive results, particularly if you start early on in the process. Of course, we can't say it's purely down to the, the diet, but that's obviously a part of it. Um, in other uh, brain injuries, uh, so there's a, a a large amount of interest in traumatic brain injury, but we're probably not at the point where we can say you should definitely do this. I, you know, if I were to go out for whatever, whatever reason, get a TBI, I'd start throwing back the ketone esters as soon as I could, uh, because I think that the evidence is good enough to suggest that it's unlikely to be harmful and there's likely to be benefit. And you know, when you're sort of it's your brain on the line, then that's a you know something that maybe you're you're willing to, to implement. But I can't say that here's this randomized clinical trial that says so. Uh, but I do think that in the next maybe four or five years that, that we'll have that evidence. I expect it uh, to 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 come along. Those trials are being done. Yeah. All right. So so talk about sort of the difference between prevention and treatment. We we've covered that and the importance of minimizing all those potential insults. But then are there specific components of nutrition that in and of themselves might have beneficial impact. For instance, omega three fatty acids. Like, what is the what is the status of of the evidence for you know DHA specifically for prevention of cognitive decline? That's uh, another uh, really great question and actually really difficult uh, to untangle. So we, I actually just published a, a paper on this, uh, looking at a DHA for cognitive decline um, that I, I I can send you and. The, the sort of lots of people have talked about how important DHA is in the brain, preventing Alzheimer's disease. People are recommending certain supplements, particularly like phospholipid forms of DHA, which are expensive, difficult to get. Um, and unfortunately, the evidence isn't that great. So DHA is absolutely critical uh, for, for uh, brain health and long-term brain function. However, when you look at the amount of DHA in the brains of people who have cognitive decline versus those that don't, it's not like those people who have cognitive decline have low DHA and those who don't have higher DHA. You know, we kind of thought that would be the case, but in those studies where they've looked, that isn't the case. Um, and you know, this comes with some caveats. It's really difficult to get uh, brain tissue from recently deceased humans and then process it accordingly so that you can measure these things. Right? That's very, very difficult. Um, but there are a number of things that could sort of play into this, right? Obviously, DHA content in the brain isn't the only thing that's important for cognitive decline. So, you know, that's maybe part of it. Um, when we think about uh, DHA uptake into the brain, uh, it seems like uh, insulin sensitivity may matter. So insulin signaling seems to be important for some of the pathways through which DHA is taken up into the brain. So if you're already insulin resistant, that may prevent some of those pathways uh, from, from working. Um, it's also possible that in people with um, apolipoprotein E4, you know, ApoE4 individuals may also uh, be not quite as good as taking DHA up into the brain. So in certain individuals, then you may consider these fancy DHA forms, which can, which, which get into the brain via other mechanisms, potentially. However, for most people, I, I do think uh, DHA is very important. Uh, but there are some things that... Um, sort of confound this, one being that your adipose tissue is a major store of DHA. This is what babies do. Your, ba uh, your baby accumulates DHA in its adipose tissue. It's actively shuttled from the mother into the baby, often at the expense of the mother's DHA stores, just to make sure the baby has enough. It's stored in the adipose, and then it's used up over time, again, to help support brain development. So your adipose can do the same. If you've eaten enough fish in your lifetime, you have a decent store of DHA. Question may become, and it's not been answered by the literature, so now we're just in sort of like hypothesis land, it may be that if you are continuously uh, hypercaloric, then at no point is your body going to access those adipose stores because they're always being built up rather than you know diminished. So you may need to have more extended periods of, say, fasting to allow you to start to access those adipose stores so that you can get access to some of that DHA. That's a possibility. Um, 
more broadly, if we think about DHA and the brain. So like I said, some people are saying that, you know, these phospholipid forms of DHA, you get them from like krill oil and things like that. You can get some pharmaceutical versions. When actually you look at studies that give DHA for multiple days, everything evens out. So if I give you one dose of phospholipid versus regular triglyceride DHA, triglyceride DHA being what you just get if you ate some salmon. Um, if I give you one dose, the phospholipid form is going to end up, more of it is going to end up in the brain. That's why people say they focus on these, these forms. However, if you, if you supplement for more than three days, everything evens out. Because what happens is that triglyceride form you know, ends up in the adipose and then gets recycled up to the brain. So when people are saying, you know, take this form of DHA for the brain, I, I don't think you need to do that. I think you could just eat fish, and you should, um, because DHA is very important. Uh, but this is a very long uh, answer to your, to your one question, um, because it is slightly complex. Um, yeah. But related to that, uh, there's um, some very nice studies, uh, randomized clinical trials that have been done based in Oxford, looking at nutrient status and cognitive decline. And they also looked at brain atrophy rates in, in, you know, in people who had cognitive impairment. And they gave um, basically a, a mixture of B vitamins, you know, mainly uh, B12 and, and folate. I think there was some B6 in there as well. And they identified people who needed this by those who had elevated homocysteine levels. And so you have people who have cognitive decline, high homocysteine, you give them B vitamins. And what they saw was that, yes, these B vitamins are protective for cognitive decline. So these uh, nutrients, very important for, for brain health. Obviously, you can take them as a supplement or you can just eat animal foods like liver um, would be my preferred uh, option. But a, a supplement is fine. But what they saw when they then stratified people by omega-3 status, they only saw benefit from the B vitamins if they also had adequate omega-3. And they did like a, a, a circulating omega-3 index, which isn't like a perfect uh, measure of what's in your brain. But it sort of gives you an idea that all these things are important and they interact. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a great answer because it, it truly is complex. And I think I think your answer shows the complexity. And one of the things I, I, I like about the topic and the way you answered it is it's one of the few areas where there is sort of this push that supplements might be better than real foods. And to me, that always causes me to balk. I, I kind of question whether supplements are ever going to be better than real foods. And I like the way you described that after three days of supplementation or, or just eating food, it sounds like it all sort of equals out, which is intuitively makes sense, right? That it just makes sense that the food should be quote unquote better or as good than any, any supplement out there. And I like the way you described that. But the second thing that you brought up is when you're talking about B vitamins, and having adequate omega-3 stores, I mean, right away, it makes me say, like, what is what is the diet that is deficient in these that would put people most at risk? And it's a, this plant-based vegan diet that seems to have this, you know, at least social media and influencer swell of being the diet that we should, quote-unquote, be following, which I completely disagree with. But would this, in your opinion, be a potential downside that we're setting people up to be B vitamin deficient and omega-3 deficient, which then could translate to cognitive decline. Although it doesn't play out maybe in some of, in many of the observational studies we've seen. Um, do you think there could be a connection there? I certainly think it's, it's possible. And it's something that gives me pause about those diets because there's certainly uh, certain, you know, I think there are, there are, there are a number of physicians in the, cognitive decline neurology space who actively promote plant-based diets as ways to improve cognitive function or prevent cognitive decline. And yes, there is going to be benefit. You've, benefit. You've dramatically improved. You know, If you move from a Western diet to an, a whole food plant-based diet, you have dramatically improved diet quality. You're going to improve you know, multiple aspects of health. You're going to improve body composition. Uh, you're probably going to decrease inflammation. You're going to improve glucose control. So all of these things are, are absolutely I think going to improve if you go to that sort of whole whole food plant based diet. Um, however, long term, you know, there's lots of evidence to to show that uh, people on plant based diets are particularly B12. Um, they're, de they're deficient in B12, and, and every smart person I know in the plant based world says you should take a, a B12 supplement if you're on a plant based diet. And I appreciate that because they've acknowledged that that's an issue. Um, folate probably less of a problem if you're if you're if you're you know eating unrefined plant foods you may you may get enough of that um omega-3s become tricky uh depending on the study 
uh, vegans may or may not have uh, a worse omega-3 status. And it's probably going to depend on, you know, what's the quality of the fats uh, that you are getting. You're getting lots of plant-based oils, lots of, you know, a little layer acid that's going to interfere with some of those pathways potentially negatively. Uh, but then you can also say if you're getting lots of chia seeds and things like that, and you're getting alpha linolenic acid, you know, some people, um, not everybody, but it depends on your genetics, can convert that to DHA. You can elongate those fats and you get your own EPA and DHA. And it's possible that people who do better on vegan diets, and so they're the ones who are uh, represented in those studies, they just happen, right? They feel they feel good on the diet, and part of that is because actually genetically they're they're pretty good at converting those things. And there are some very interesting studies looking at um, your most recent ancestors, where your ancestors uh, more recently um, agriculturalists or not, which gives you some idea of the diet that you ate. Um, and so, if you're you know from somewhere closer to the equator, they may have been agriculturalists earlier. They're more likely to have been getting. Uh, uh, omega-3, you know, shorter chain omega-3s like ALA from the diet, and actually they're better uh, genetically at converting those. Whereas, you know, myself, I'm from a Northern European ancestry. My ancestors were eating lots of fish. I never, you know, and probably not a lot of chia seeds. So, <laughs> so you know, me genetically, I, I will probably be better off getting it from from a you know a seafood source. So, you know, those things do start to to, to come into play as well. well. That's fascinating. Just thinking about where your ancestors are from. Uh, are going to influence how well you can incorporate those and convert them to the form you need. And I think that's an important point that even even in the best circumstances, converting ALA to uh, DHA is is an inefficient process, yeah. even in the best of circumstances. So if you're genetically sort of hampered to begin with, it's going to be very poor. So that that makes sense. And and so while we're on the topic of genetics influencing your diet or maybe the diet you should choose, you brought up ApoE4 previously, which is, you know, labeled the Alzheimer's gene correctly or incorrectly, right? As with any label, it's, it's overly simplistic, but it certainly can increase your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease or, or, or put you more at risk for that. So would you recommend if somebody knows their ApoE4 status and they have both, um, they have two mutations, so they're four slash four, um, which is the highest risk for Alzheimer's, should they lead a different life than somebody who has a three slash three, the wild type? You know, would you recommend they not do mixed martial arts and not play professional football? Or would you recommend they follow a specific diet? Like, should that inform your lifestyle choices? Yeah, I, I always get really squirrely when we start to talk about genetics because there's a, an increasing body of evidence to say that what we think about our genes may have more of a physiological effect than actually those genes themselves do. Um, so, uh, so I'll give you an example. Interesting. There's, um, uh, they did a study where they, they took people and they put them on a treadmill uh, to, to look at their exercise capacity, right? It's like a 30 minute treadmill test. And then they uh, randomized them to say, you have this good gene for aerobic performance, or you have this bad gene for aerobic performance. Um, and then they had them redo the treadmill test. The people who were told they had the bad aerobic gene did worse on the treadmill test the second time. Uh, and the people who were told they had the good gene did, just did exactly the same. The problem was that 50-50 got the right information. So yeah. even if you have the good, the good aerobic gene, which isn't really a thing, uh, in, in most respects. If you were told you had the bad version, then your performance got worse. Um, and they also, uh, they did, a, within the same study, they looked at the FTO gene, which is the fat and uh, the fat mass obesity associated protein, which is the one polymorphism that's most associated with obesity and overweight, even though the effect is teeny tiny, so much that I wouldn't even worry about it. Um, and they did the same thing. And then they told them, you know, you have the good or the bad gene for FTO. And then they did um, a standardized meal before and after. And then they asked about satiety and they looked at uh, increase in hormones like GLP-1, uh, peptide of YY. And being told about your genotype, whether it was correct or not, actively changed the hormones that are released after a meal and actively changed society. So it's what you think. It's not just this... Um, sort of a, a you know ephemeral thing, right? It is actually yeah. changing the hormones that you get after a meal based on what you've. That's been fascinating. 
I can see someone subjectively being hungrier or, or more full after that, but to actually physically change the hormone secretion, that's yeah. interesting. So so would you say we're all better off not knowing our, our <laughs> genetic makeup and not knowing our APOE status, not getting the 23andMe studies? Are we just better off not knowing? To, to like often, my answer would be, I think you're better off not knowing. And yeah. the reason is that the same things matter regardless of your genetics. And again, multiple studies show this, that regardless of your polygenic risk for cardiovascular disease, the same uh, lifestyle habits are still beneficial. Um, and we also know that, so, so we talk about APOE4. In a Western population, um, your, your, APO, your APOE genotype contributes about 5% of your Alzheimer's risk. So it's a small, you know, it's significant, but it's small. Uh, when you look at other populations where we've had the opportunity to look and they're living, they're more ancestral, right? They're still either hunter-gatherer uh, communities or they're sort of closer to um, the lifestyle that their more recent ancestors, you know, lived. Um, so say uh, there are Kenyan populations where your APOE4 genotype has, or your APOE genotype has no association with your risk of cognitive decline. Um, the Bolivian semen who are a hunter-gatherer group that have been actively studied for you know now for decades, in those particularly with um, it was in those who have they have a high uh, incidence of parasitic infections in that community, obviously because that's just part of how they live um, and the environment they're exposed to. Particularly in those that have a parasitic infection, ApoE4 is protective of cognitive decline. Right, so then you have these certain scenarios where either it has no effect or it can be protective. So the reason why I mention that is because APOE4 is this significant risk factor for cognitive decline in a westernized society. So if we were to remove or, or modify some of those things, right, so we don't eat a Western diet and have, you know, have these large swings in blood sugar that have been normalized, uh, and we don't um, have you know an unhealthy body composition and we sleep properly and we don't have these uh, uh, other stresses and we move frequently. I'm not convinced that ApoE4 is going to make that much of a difference. I think you're then going to take away the vast majority of the risk. Um, however, I would say that if you were ApoE4, you know, definitely if you're homozygous, I would not participate in a hobby that involved getting punched in the head a lot. Um, because I think we have, again, the, the, the data aren't great. But so from the acute recovery from a concussion perspective, we're not, you know, it's not clear whether APOE4 is deleterious. Like some studies say yes, some studies say no. But I think there's sort of this accumulating body of evidence that says if you're going to repeatedly injure your brain, APOE4 may make that worse. Um, so, so again, I think if you live a, a, life, a lifestyle that is generally protective of those things that like we talked about earlier, then, I, then I, you don't need to worry about it. But if you are going to put your brain in harm's way, you know, maybe then, maybe then you have to think about these things. Yeah, great, great description about the, the impact of the environment you're in on your genetics. And I like the comparison about hunter-gatherer tribes, people living in different societies with completely different uh, lifestyle structures that, that how ApoE4 does or does not impact um, their risk. And, and that says a lot for it's in our control, right? Your, your genes are not, don't cast your future for you. It's still all within your control and your lifestyle. And I think that's so important. Now, um, you also mentioned sleep. So one last topic here to, to touch on, uh, you know, sleep is one of those things that I think a lot of people talk about. I'm a big proponent of sleep hygiene, but the individual sort of says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And blows it off and, and kind of doesn't think it's that important because life is busy. Life is crazy, right? And, and sleep is one of those things that if you can shave off a little bit of sleep, you get a little more time in your day to do the things you want to do. But how much is that really hurting us from a cognitive standpoint? Like, where, Where's the science on that? You know, I, I'm really happy that sleep has started to become this sexy thing again. Like, it's okay to sleep. Uh, and certainly, <laughs> you, know, at, you know, it used to be you know, sleep when you're dead, all that kind of stuff, burn right. the candle at both ends. But now I think there's been this increased focus on sleep, which is a, which is really important. However, obviously not everybody is doing that. Um, there are some people who, uh, so there's a very good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Greg Potter, he is a circadian biologist, um, and he likes to mention that our sleep at a population level isn't necessarily as bad as some people paint it. Some people paint it as this like catastrophic thing where nobody sleeps enough and everybody's sleep deprived. But actually the data don't, 
support that necessarily. Like not everybody sleeps as badly as as we think they do. So, you know, and you're probably starting to pick up that I, it's very important to me that we don't catastrophize about these things because that then creates a problem in itself. Like they've done studies where you randomize individuals. So like individuals, they were slept slept either eight or five hours, but they didn't they didn't know the clock time. Right? You just like go to sleep in a lab and you're woken up after eight or five hours and, and you, then they manipulated the clock time. So then they told you, well, you slept either five or eight hours, regardless of whether you slept five or eight hours, right? You crossed over. Those people who slept five hours but were told they slept eight hours did not have a decrement in cognitive performance. But those really? who slept eight hours and were told they, were, they slept five hours, their cognitive performance decreased. So. Wow. This is one of the issues that I have with sleep trackers, which aren't necessarily great. Um, and this foc- hyper-focus on sleep, because if you're told you slept poorly, regardless of whether that's true or not, that can have an effect on your, on your function. I think that's important. So um, ha- that being said, sleep is very important for preventing cognitive decline. And I think the best data that we have, uh, there was a recent meta-regression that looked at um, sort of... Uh, ranges of of sleep length and cognitive decline and it seems that you need to get at least six hours sleep to uh you know prevent any negative effect on on long-term cognitive function and more isn't always necessarily better so i think if you're sleeping fewer than six hours a night i would certainly be worried about your long-term you know risk of uh, cognitive decline However, I, I can't say that you have to sleep eight hours or else you'll be at risk because the data don't don't support that. So there there does seem yeah. to be a cutoff and it's somewhere around six hours, which is hopefully, you know, hopefully most people are, are sleeping longer than that. Right. Yeah, I think that's a great point to put in perspective because the other thing is I think a lot of the data from maybe shift workers or people whose sleep-wake cycle are completely reversed is sort of translated back to the average person, which yeah. d- doesn't quite fit. So yeah, I think it's, it's really good how you put that into perspective. And, and you know what? I got to admit, I lied. I said one last question, but I wanted to do one more topic <laughs> here. And that and that's intermittent fasting because you, we talked about um, what you can do to sort of limit the insults to your brain and in and, and the and, you know metabolic and environmental and the exposures. So now intermittent fasting comes along and has sort of this uh, almost halo effect that it taps into autophagy and can reverse any damage that's being done or really help, you know, rejuvenate the brain. And, you know, intermittent fasting is great for so many different things. Autophagy is real, even if misunderstood in so many ways. So how do you see intermittent fasting, autophagy helping with cognitive decline? Yeah, you've, you've, you've stumbled on one of my favorite topics, um, whether or not on a, a by design, but the this uh, sort of intermittent fasting or you know prolonged periods of fasting and the sort of the halo effect that they have, it does irk me uh, for a number of reasons. One being that yes, autophagy is important. Um, autophagy in the brain is very different, you know, based on the scenario. Like uh, in the same injury model, um, you can upregulate or downregulate autophagy and both are protective against brain injury, which is like, doesn't make any sense. So like the first point is that we don't understand it as well as most people say that we do. And then also when uh, you, you know, they do most of the studies where they do autophagy, uh, where they look at autophagy in humans with fasting, they, you know, make people fast. And then they look at the, the expression. So it's the MRNA of autophagy associated proteins in peripheral blood cells that are like circulating in your blood. Like that doesn't mean that more autophagy is happening and it doesn't mean that more autophagy is happening in your tissues. So like we actually have very little evidence to say that X amount of fasting does, you know, activates X amount of autophagy in X tissue in the humans, in humans. Like we have almost like no evidence for that. Um, I do think uh, intermittent fasting, time restricted eating can be beneficial but generally because they help people improve their diet quality and total caloric intake, right? There, you know, there's some nice uh, work by Sachin Panda that shows that if you tell people to stop eating at 7 or 8 p.m., then they don't eat that, you know, ice cream while they're sat on the couch. So they don't drink that extra beer, um, right? And so they automatically improve their diet quality and they reduce their caloric intake. So it's, it's beneficial from that, from that standpoint. Um, when you look 
at the if you sort of like try and create this confluence of of evidence from human studies and animal studies so you look at uh so one of the tissues that we can look at for you know activation of autophagy in humans is muscle tissues and you do muscle biopsies and then you can do obviously something similar in animals in animals you can you can look at all the tissues that you want at, at certain time points so if we look at um the amount of fasting or the period of fasting that it takes um you know to get similar amounts of autophagy and similar tissues in humans and mice, I think you probably need to, to fast for about three days to get significant upregulation of autophagy. And so that's looking at uh, muscle tissue, and that sort of corresponds to similar changes that you see in animals, you see it in the brain and the liver, tissues that you care about. That same level of autophagy that you're getting approximately with three days uh, of fasting in humans. And again, I'm you have to, I'm sort of like having to pick from lots of different places. So this is not, right. don't take it as, as, as like hard evidence. Right. But you get a similar activation of, of autophagy in the muscle tissue. And if you then do this in animals, if you see that amount of aut autophagy in the muscles, you're also getting it in the brain and other things that you might care about. 30 minutes of aerobic exercise upregulates autophagy as much as three days of fasting. Aerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise. So 70% of um, uh, VO2 max wattage. So basically, your average going for a jog, sitting on a bike, uh, maybe even a brisk walk, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're sort of going for it, that amount of exercise for 30 minutes gives you the same amount of autophagy upregulation as three days of fasting. And, you know, you may want to fast for other reasons, and that's great, but I know which option I would pick. Uh, personally. <laughs> um, so I just, so like autophagy is important, um, but it's a process that automatically happens when we exercise. So I, d I just think, you know, it's important to put that in perspective as well. Yeah, that's a great perspective. Then when you factor in time restricted eating plus aerobic or resistance or interval training exercise, plus a healthy diet that maybe limits carbohydrates and lowers insulin. Like how does that impact autophagy versus a three day fast like that? I, you, you open up a whole window of say, well, let's look at this from a different perspective. And I think that's so important rather than focusing, this is the one way to get autophagy yeah. to hit autophagy. And yes, it can work and yes, it's effective, but what are the other options too? I think that's great. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion. Um, I really appreciate your perspective because you put things into perspective and you really say, let's take take a look and see what this really means, both from a practical standpoint, a scientific standpoint. Um, and I'm really excited that I'm going to get to meet up with you again at the Metabolic Health Summit in, in May in Santa Barbara. And one of my jobs there is going to be to interview the speaker. So I'm excited to hear your talk and to be able to interview you, hopefully again, after your talk to go into a little more detail. So um, I just want to say thank you again. I look forward to seeing you again in May in Santa Barbara. Yeah, likewise. I'm uh, really looking forward to it and uh, to our any uh, future conversations. And, and like I said, right at the beginning, I, I really appreciate um, this uh, the invitation and uh, all of your questions, which, which are really great and things that you know I think are important and hopefully will sort of help people uh, implement even just simple simple changes that can have a big impact.